Please welcome Daniel Nathrock, founder and CEO, Ada Health, Erica Moines, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Republic of Panama, Rolf Hunger, Area Head, Roche Pharma Latin America, and Bloomberg's David Papadopoulos. Good morning, all. Uh, welcome to our conversation about preparing for the next pandemic. I got to say right off the bat, like, preparing for the next pandemic, I'm like, come on. I mean, I don't want to go there yet. I'm not ready for that. We got to get out of this first one. But I do know, Conseiller, that you um, have played a big role uh, for Panama in fighting this pandemic. Um, and I also know that knowing how prepared you are, that I'm sure you guys are already thinking about the next pandemic and what you need to do to pre prepare for it. So what are you doing? And what, from the lessons you've learned from this one, what is applicable going forward? Thank you. I think, um, so what are we doing? We're all struggling to get out of it. And, and I think the idea of any form of lockdown or getting this ki the kids away from school is unthinkable. So preparing and bracing that every wave that comes uh, doesn't really affect the economy the way that the previous um, pandemic did. Um, it's absolutely paramount to, I think, not only Panama, but to all countries. Um, I want to talk a little bit, because my role as Mo Minister of Foreign Affairs deals also regionally with other countries, what are we doing as a region for the next pandemic? And I think that's important because if you tally how this region fared, um, it was terrible. There were, we have 8% of the population Latin American in the Caribbean, we had over 28% death. So as a region, it was the hardest hit in the planet. Um, and one of the key elements, or actually there were two, one is the structural, how you are preparing in terms of the infrastructure, um, healthcare, and the second one, how we were able to acquire the vaccines. Right. Um, Panama um, was able to, before I think uh, most countries were thinking about it, to prepare and, and go out into the market and, and arrange bilaterally right. with, with some of the pharmaceutical companies. But we tried and we try to get support regionally to do a, a, and to buy them as a block. We didn't do that the first time. And we are actively advocating to prepare and to act as a block. You see the EU is doing that. Right. Um, African nations have already um, aligned themselves. And you have so much more Got power it. to do that. So, you know, and I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because that actually was something I was going to get at um, later. Um, Right, there did seem to be a certain uncivilized nature to the free-for-all in trying to acquire pandemics first time around. So you do believe that next time around, we're already seeing signs that it will be different, not just for Panama, but broadly speaking for the globe and the whole process? It, it has to be. It's the only way I think people have understood. It doesn't matter if you're able to vaccinate your country if your neighbors are so struggling, because right. you're going to continue getting it. There's no way of closing the borders. There's no way of shutting yourself from the world. So I think this is a lesson that all, the planet has learned. and. And the way that it was distributed, the vaccines the first time, clearly did not work. You look at Panama, we're going to our fourth dose, and we have countries here that are starting the right. first round. So right. um, that disparity cannot continue, cannot continue happening. Now, Rolf, I do know that, um, as the Canciller was saying, this region, not just Central America and the Caribbean, but really all of Latin America, was very hard hit. You know, Peru, death per capita, number one in the world but many other countries in the region not too far behind. So um, from your point of view, uh, having been in this region for many, many years, um, what, what went wrong? What, what, where, where, what were the mistakes? How, how did we get to this place? Yeah, thanks, and thanks for the opportunity to be here. So first of all, I think we have to see that uh, the PAHO recommends all the countries to invest 6% in public health uh, of the GDP. Right. And the average in Latin America is 3.7. So basically, there is, a, for a long term, an underinvestment in health. 
And I think what you have seen is you have had the economic consequences as well for the long lockdowns that you had to do in order to make sure that the capacity is basically sufficiently for the, the demand that exists. So you right. have seen this uh, dramatic scenes in Guayaquil, in, in some parts of Peru, in, in some parts of, uh, of Brazil. Right. In, um, and I think it's clearly that the capacity wasn't there to handle it. And I think that's, that's the main thing. I would say we, we missed a sufficient inv investment in health for a long time. And I hope that we learned the lesson and will now change this and invest more, uh, invest better, use as well the learnings of the lack of data that existed. Right. And right. I think there's lots of things that, uh, that needs to be learned in, from this pandemic. Got it. By the way, I'm just realizing now that we're all on stage and under site, we, we, we're, we've mind melded. We're all in blue here, shades of blue up here. On the, that was not planned, <laughs> at least I don't think. Um, there actually is a question for a poll question here for the audience. Preparing for the next public health crisis, you will all dutifully vote here. Coming out of the pandemic, Latin America's top health care priorities should be local and or regional capacity to produce vaccines, universal health care to basic, sorry, universal access to basic health care, and C is mitigating causes of disease such as poor sanitation and pollution. Please vote and we will let you know how you vote. Uh, Daniel. Um, I'm preparing for the next pandemic and, and what, what, can be do, what can be done to confront it. I mean, you were, you've been telling me some statistics that kind of blew me away, that the world is short, if I understood you correctly, 10 million doctors. Um, so it's kind of like, forget about the nurse shortage, the doctor shortage, and that one billion people in the world will never see a doctor in their lives. Um, it's kind of amazing. Um, how, how, given those realities, how can we prepare for the next public health crisis? How realistic is it? I think one thing this pandemic has uh, done is uh, shine a spotlight on the ability of digital tools to help uh, improve access for, for people globally, especially those you just mentioned who, who need it most and who unfortunately will not have access to doctors or not easy uh, access to doctors. Um, so in this way, the pandemic has kind of acted as an accelerant for the adoption of digital tools, and that's probably a great opportunity, especially in places uh, that are underserved. Um, and uh, we saw this even in the US uh, in other places where telehealth but also adoption of AI tools such as ADA uh, has really uh, picked up during the pandemic. And, and I think that's, that's something that um, governments and other stakeholders in the, in the health industry um, should hopefully not go back on but right. embrace even more. Going right. Forward. Now I know that you, you are the founder of a startup that has something right in that space um, and, and I know that it's been growing and I guess the skeptic in me will ask you a couple questions. One is um, I'm not talking to some AI bot to, to, to tell them my health secrets. I'm not comfortable doing that. Um, so how scalable is it at a, at a, at a big level um, to, to address some of this issue? Um, and how accurate is the AI? Um, and, and then I also wonder, God, doctors must hate this, right? Or do they embrace it? So, you know, when we started this 12 years ago, um, I was wondering if doctors were going to be very skeptical about it, but uh, because they don't like Google very much, for instance. Uh, so when people Google their own symptoms, which probably most of us uh, Who have Googles done their That's another poll question. Who Googles their own symptoms? Most of don't us have done Google it. your own symptoms. And then you, then you arrive at your doctor's office and you've Googled all this really... Convinced sort of you're going to die immediately. Far off stuff. And then, right. and then you try to explain to your doctor that that must be what you have. Then it, it's kind of, it adds to the, uh, to the time the doctor has to spend right. to get you away from that. And they only have, in the Western world, they only have about eight minutes per patient. Um, but, you know, with, with our solution, it's different because uh, it, we've basically done some of the work of the doctor by automating, taking right. the patient history, uh, and, and doctors like that they basically at a glance see, uh, okay, this is the constellation of uh, symptoms the patient is reporting based on that. These could be the most probable diagnosis and that's what I should be doing next to get to the confirmed diagnosis. So, so it's very different. Uh, doctors have actually reacted very positively um, and the, the trust element that you mentioned is also interesting. Uh, for many things like uh, mental health or sexual diseases, right. uh, people actually prefer talking to a bot initially. If you think about certain parts of the world where there's a lot of stigma sure, associated, sure. Uh, so, so actually that's um, an advantage, not a disadvantage. Are your robots 
accurate? Do they yes. know what so, they're talking so about? So that's obviously the, the, the key thing. If, it, if it's not accurate, then it doesn't add value. That's like searching uh, in Google. Exactly. So, so uh, if you search on Google, basically you enter one search term. You don't go to your doctor's office and you throw in one search term and you expect the doctor to come up with an accurate diagnosis, right? So we've modeled uh, our bot uh, according to what a really good doctor would do, which is sort of narrowing down by asking questions and then possibly taking some tests. Uh, so uh, the, the evidence is really important to us. There are, there are various studies out there which show that our technology at this stage is comparable to the accuracy of a family doctor in the US, the UK, Germany, Spain. Got it. Panama. Very good. We have uh, our poll uh, numbers are in, uh, and uh, overwhelmingly, the audience votes for B, universal access to basic health care as the top priority for the region. Um, makes sense to me. Uh, Rolf, one of the things that you were telling me is that um, one of the things that really jumped out at you and you thought was a positive uh, from all this was the spirit of collaboration you saw among pharmaceutical companies in the industry. Tell us both a little bit what, what that actually looked like and, and how that played out. And, and are you optimistic that, that this is something that will translate and continue forward? Or was this just some one-off? We were in a moment, we were on a war footing, so we were buddies, but now we're back to all fighting each other. Well, I think um, we have seen a uh, lot of different applications and depending on the need of the countries. So, for example, what we have done is at the very beginning, we, we have plenty of doctors in our, uh, in our workforce and we put them at disposal for different governments to arm basically call centers and to right. give basic information. So we obviously agreed upon any <laughs> protocols. But in other places, um, one of the big issues was, for example, transporting of the physicians uh, to the hospitals. So right. uh, you can imagine that uh, the, if the physician gets sick in a very crowded public transport, right. uh, that's what they don't want. So we provided in several places basically the free transport so used the uh, connection right. with Uber to do this and right. things like that. So, but that's only the beginning. Then afterwards I think it's more and more translated in how do you make sure that diagnosis works well and afterwards for the more chronic patients, how do you make sure that they probably don't have to go to the hospital? So, what the, right. uh, and there comes in what uh, any lecture said. So it goes into telehealth, it goes into telemonitoring of patients in the, uh, outside. So I think there's lots that we have seen happening. Um, what I see is that the regulations have changed and so they're right. changing and you allow more of this telehealth happening. Uh, which I right. think is a benefit to the... Those barriers that are coming down to telehealth, uh, th that is, um, we're not going back, right? That's just going to continue to grow? You saw, obviously, that some of the regulation still needs to be adapted. Something, it happens right. in an emergency, but afterwards you need to adapt the regulation so that actually you are up to date with all the technological changes that are out there. So that's in process, I would say. Um, in Panama, telehealth, is it a thing? It, so we started with the pandemic, and, and yes, we, we were able to implement and in remote areas were getting um, virtual consultations that was needed. There, it was the only way, so it's actually something um, I think we just need to embrace those technologies because it's the only way that it allows you to actually get the access in remote areas anyway. Got it. Now, on the collaboration front, uh, you, we were talking yesterday, and you were telling us about the, the pretty precipitous drop-off in migrants who um, have, in part sparked by the pandemic, co been coming north up through Panama, through the Darien Gap. Tell us a little bit about those numbers, and, and how did you indeed achieve this, this, this big decline? Yeah, so... Um in part because of the pandemic, uh, we saw a rise from 2019 to 2020. We went from 8,000 migrants that crossed our borders. On, in a year. Right. In a year to 130,000 in a year. So last year, 130,000 right. migrants crossed. Um, and so this spike and this uh, increase was in part, so most borders were closed for some part of 2019. Right. Then they got open. Right. Um, and between the levels of poverty rising, less uh, ability to work in, right. in the locations where they were, uh, mostly in South America, then they started making their way up. And so we started collaborating with 
um, all the countries involved, all the way from the U.S. to South American countries and the Caribbean, uh, to come up with solutions, uh, generate awareness, and on the uh, health support, Panama provides health support to every single migrant that crosses through Panama, and that involves not just the general checkup, uh, but we're doing now COVID vaccine and even COVID testing. So in the midst of a pandemic, how difficult this was that you were having migrants that potentially had COVID going through maybe five countries. Panama is the first country where they get testing. So you know, for, you, you knew after Panama that we were making sure right. that, that you know we were not continuing spreading the disease and they were actually getting the care that they need. Now this big drop in numbers, does it mean that the migrant crisis as you see it is over? I, I don't think that the migration as a phenomenon is over, for sure. Um, there will always be different routes. There will be different nationalities. It is um, the phenomenon of our century, and we need to deal with it and continue playing, shedding light on it, what's happening, and how to manage it. Got it. Um, Daniel, um, your app, um, as you see, is something of a uh, leading indicator in terms of COVID trends. Um, tell us what you've noticed over the course of the pandemic in terms of your numbers and how, what you see and how they compare to broader trends. So, so every, every couple of seconds, someone somewhere in the world is entering a new case in our app, so we, can, we have a relevant statistic sample size where we could see that the number of COVID cases, which is about 25% of all the assessments that happen uh, in ADA, uh, develop in parallel to the published numbers that you can see on the websites of Johns Hopkins, etc. But I think we need to analyze the data even more, and this is where technology can help, uh, because we shouldn't only look at transmission and infection rates. We also need to look at the indirect effects uh, of measures such as lockdowns uh, and so on. So what we did is we did a data analysis where we looked at the development over time uh, during one year of, of COVID uh, of depression, especially in children and adolescents in, in different countries. And what we could see, for instance, was in Germany where schools and kindergartens were closed for a very, very long time. Depression in children went up by over 100%. In Switzerland, which is arguably not that different uh, from Germany, they, they had uh, left the schools and kindergartens open and there was no rise in depression in, in children. So, so I think we, you know, I would advise governments to take a holistic view uh, and look at, at health overall, and uh, that includes mental health. Now, though, but also your, through your data, before there were broader spikes, you see the broader spikes in COVID, you actually saw with a certain lead time spikes in people entering effectively what were COVID cases through the app, right? Yes, which makes sense because people use our app mostly before they go right. see the doctor. So we, we see things actually a little bit before uh, certain public health systems would see them. For instance, in Germany, once again, I'm originally from Germany, uh, it's mostly still facts and sometimes letters by which the public health authorities right. communicate with each other. So. Again, using technology can so, be so really this, useful. So this does sound like a good leading indicator, and I guess I don't understand why it's not on the Bloomberg terminal. Like, we need that data on the terminal. Probably, probably yeah. one thing to add on this, yes. uh, what we have seen as well as a, as a negative impact of the, the COVID crisis. So you always talk about only the COVID patients. Right. But I think what you have to see is the impact on the chronic diseases or on cancer or on others that actually were not treated during this time Right. and actually are creating a, a bigger health crisis because you have all these people being in the waiting list for trying to get treated. And very often, if you think in cancer, for example, if you would have a year or two years right. ago have detected this in the early phase, right. now it's, it's probably late. And it, this is, we have data which shows that, for example, a breast cancer in early phase is probably half the cost than if, in later stage. Right. So this is the, the, the consequences that we still face as, as health systems. Right, and those consequences are still playing out. Yes. I mean, those are still to come. Yes. You know, when you talk about, um, and this is a very data-intensive group here, which I like, again, perfect for Bloomberg. You guys are... All right, it's a great group here. Um, when you talk about there's been greater, there has been greater data sharing um, during the pandemic, and you're seeing more of that. But what it, what does that actually look like? What kind of data is now being shared more? Well, probably not enough, okay. uh, because I think um, Panama's actually done something interesting. Because you have now the the, the QR code on the on the on the what is it called the cedula. Um, 
Uh, so what is it? The, the, ID, the ID card, yeah. And uh, what we actually wanted to do is, if you think long term, right. is if imagine that as well the migrants that you mentioned, if everybody would have all the health data right. on the cell phone and walk around so that you don't have to repeat all the tests. So that right. would decrease healthcare costs tremendously. So, but we are not there yet. So that's something that has to be developed. And I think apps like uh, Daniel's apps, that, uh, this can, all can help in order to get this data. Got it. Now, I'll, um, I'll throw this out to you, Ralph, but to, to all of you, and, and to sort of, as we wind up here, to try to, um, and you need to give us a, a good answer here. So I guess, because everyone is tired of the pandemic, um, as you can see. Um, do we feel like, or do you feel like, we are weeks and months away from moving to a world in which we treat this in a, as a seasonal flu kind of thing, or are we still years away? Um, I've stumped Rob. Yeah, the problem is the forecast, uh, there are many things that can go wrong still. So you, any mutation that I kill still can go wrong, so I think it's too early to say whether we are over it. The signs are good, because the, the mutations that you have seen now, they are less severe, Right. And that's why you have, as well, the freedom that to do events like this. One. Right. So when we're here a year from now, or whenever two years, are we still going to be masked up? Is the audience still going to be masked up? We don't up? know yet. We don't know yet. Concierge, what do you think? I, I think that it's almost irrelevant if we're prepared for it. Meaning, if you have, so Panama, for instance, increased the amount of ICU units that we have. Right. Most countries did. We were not prepared, but we got ourselves to the place that you need to be in terms of managing. So, so long as you're ready to manage it right. and race, and you don't stop as we did, as we all did. So it's, it's a matter of being ready and having right. your I mean, to, to, to Daniel's point earlier, but we're not, we're not thinking you're talking about a return to lockdowns kind of thing again, right? There are incredible mental health repercussions from that. There are repercussions in terms of, say, right? The Western world, as we understand, is not returning back to that, right? I mean, is that correct? That, that, at least that phase is over? I sure hope so. As an entrepreneur, I want to be an optimist. So I think uh, it's, it's months away if we use the amazing vaccines and also treatment that, that's now available. We just need to make sure that the treatment gets distributed uh, in an equitable way and that we identify the people who are eligible and, and get it to them. And again, I'm obviously biased, but technology can, can play a big role and help there. Uh, last question, then we, we need to wrap up here. But so tell, tell the audience the, la the Spanish you chose for your, this was a, this was a big problem. Apparently, you did not choose Panamanian Spanish. Well, um, we, we broadly chose Latin American Spanish, which, you know, I know that's not really a thing, but it's a little bit different from uh, Castellano in, in Spain. And uh, we've gotten in trouble with some Spanish people, but we just want to reach as many people as possible. So we also chose the Brazilian Portuguese. We initially started with U.S. English, but uh, UK doctors got really mad, so we had to we had to also create a, a British English word version. Well, you're gonna also then you're next time you're here you're gonna need a Panamanian Spanish. Yeah, very good. Thank you very much, everybody. It's been a Thank pleasure. you.